So this is an incredible series, not series season for us. Last week, as you know, if you were at church, we did a, an unveiling of a new look for his church. And I just want to spend two minutes or rather five minutes talking about um, the significance of why we look like we look going forwards and just talk about the values that will take us there. I only want to revisit it because I know that not everybody was there. And I also know that after four weeks, nobody remembers what happens, had happened a month ago in church. And so we want to make sure that we, as much as we can, establish these in the heart of this church, these values, and that we hold on to them as we move forward. Amen. So a couple of thoughts, if there's the logo, um, most people don't have a problem with his church, but there's our questions about the house. Now we also, I also had questions about the house, but I really want to just share the heart. The first significance about the house is it's so trendy right now. Um, everybody likes it. I'm only playing, but it is quite, it looks nice. So that's, uh, you already have me with nice, but I'm going to go a little bit deeper than nice because I do like to be deep. But uh, I just want to, the context of last week's service, we try to create a context for what God has been doing in us as a family over the year. And if you remember the thought that we felt God give us in the beginning of the year, our vision for the year was to be strong. And the context of that scripture in Joshua 1 verse 9 was Israel getting ready to possess the promises, and in their case was the promised land. But we know that what had to happen in Israel was there was preparation that needs to happen in their identity. God really completed a work that he had been doing in them for 40 years in the wilderness. And in order for them to obtain the promise, they had to come into a new identity that could steward the promise and steward it well. And so we just thought, not knowing when we started where we were going through the year, but looking back, realizing the wisdom of God and realizing, I think he's calling for a new wineskin so that this house could house or carry new wine. Amen. So we want the promises of God. I want to read you a few scriptures to explain uh, why we've gone the direction we have. The first is, and I read it last week, it's 1 Peter 2, 4 and 5. And it says, as you come to him, the living stone, rejected by humans, but chosen by God and precious to God, you also, like living stones, are being built into a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood. I just want to touch on that scripture, but for this week, I want to just touch on the fact that Peter writes, we are being built. We are not complete. As I think often the perception of the world is the church gives off this picture of perfection and holiness. And we know perfection and holiness is never really a complete work or a finished work in us. But as long as we're unable to relate that to the world, then we've probably lost the world. We've created a barrier, not a bridge. And some of the, the thinking behind this little house that doesn't look quite like quite normal is really who we are, aren't we? We're, we're, we love God, we serve God, but we'll never profess to be perfect and we'll never pro profess to be finished works. But we know the goodness of God is leading us down that road. So we are imperfect people serving a perfect God and that is us as the church. Uh, early on in my days on staff, I felt God gave me, give me this word and and it's just a word that stuck with me. So it's not something I ran, I, I ran and wrote down, but there's probably about four specific words that God's given me over my, my season of serving God. And there's, those four words are very clear in my mind. There's probably many words, but four or five that I remember very clearly. And one of them was, one of them was God saying, you're gonna be part of rebuilding a sanctuary or the sanctuary. And I didn't take much notice to what that was, but I knew that it was something special and I knew that it was something that was to be set apart for the purposes of God. And I really think as we look at that house, that God is calling us back to a place of appreciating his house and what it is and what should be found in his house. Uh, I read you the scripture out of 1 Peter 1, 14 and 15. It says, but just as he who called you is holy, so be holy in everything that you do. Now the word holiness, not all of us relate to. In fact, if you do relate to that word, come see me. I'd like you to impart holiness to me. But but. If we look at the roots of the word, it speaks about being different. It's, the, it's the, the uniqueness of Christianity or believers is that we're set apart. We're not perfect, perfect in behavior, perfect in appearance. We're just set apart. So we're different. What happens in this, the purpose of the house is different to every other house. So the, the word was used to describe a temple. Why? Because the temple, temple was distinctly different to every other building. It was used to describe the believer. Why? Because the believer's life and what, what existed in their heart was different to every other building. It never spoke about perfection. It never spoke about that there would never be a mess in the house and that the house would ever be perfect. But it did speak about the call over the house was to be distinctly different. Amen. So 
So as we go forward, we want to create, not perfection, but we want to create a sense of sanctuary in this place. That what you would find in God's presence, you would also find in this house. Um, when I think of sanctuary, I think of a few of these words or these thoughts. In the sanctuary, it's a holy place. It's a sacred place, but it's also a safe place. It's a place of learning. It's a place where God's word is taught. It's a place where he is present. It's a place of his presence. It's a place where we encounter him. He's in the sanctuary. It's a place where mercy is found and mercy is extended. It's a place where no matter who you are and where you come from, therein you find immunity, you find refuge, you're accepted, and you're loved. It's a place where you are valued, and it's a place where people grow and people change. Amen. In the sanctuary, you will find healing, you'll find restoration, and it'll be a place where destinies are born and destinies are fulfilled. In the sanctuary, there will be miracles. In the sanctuary, God is reverenced. And in the sanctuary, there is great faith. And so our endeavor, moving forwards and becoming suitable to the many promises of God that lie in the future, is not to be perfect, but maybe to accept our imperfection and take that and exchange it for his perfection, his power, his goodness, his kindness, that we would always have those things most prominent in this house. Amen. So we've taken six values out of what we believe a sanctuary to be, what should be found in the sanctuary, and we've marked them as these are the values that we are going to live by and build with as we move into the future. Now remember, these values are intangible values, which means we can't see them, but if somebody comes in here, they experience them as we hold on to them. Amen. So the first is love, that in this house you are loved, and if you know the love of God as you come into this place, into community, what I expect to happen is as people come in, they would experience the love of God and they would experience the love of community because it's a value that we protect and we preserve. The second value is unity, that in this house we are united, which governs and dictates our behavior because everything we do needs to contribute and build unity and nothing we do should be allowed in this place that breaks down relationship, unity and community. Amen. <clears throat> the third is faith, that in this house we want great faith, but there's three specific areas that we'd love to be present in this place all the time, that we would have faithful souls, that we would never be lacking in faith to believe that even the, uh, the most unreachable life that you know can be reached in God's presence, amen, that we would have faith for hearing God, not that we would hear God from a pulpit, but that we would hear God in our own lives, for our own lives, that the people of God have access to God to hear his voice and that our experience as community would be that we are a people that continually hear his voice. And then lastly, that we would always have faith for breakthrough, breakthrough of many kinds, but this place would be a place of miracles as we come together corporately standing in agreement for the many challenges and at the, for the many mountains that stand in our way of the promises in the future. Amen. We're halfway there. Is everybody okay? The fourth is excellence. So excellence and I'm just rushing through this. Obviously, we preached on these last week, and I really encourage you to go back and uh, listen to the podcast. And if you don't have access to internet, come and tell us so we can make sure that you get that, that service, not because it was exhilarating, but because it was significant. And we want every life to be on board and uh, know what God is saying. The fourth value that we're moving forwards with is excellence. Now, these two areas of excellence that we really want to separate but appreciate and the first is stewardship, that we would always be looking to do well with what we have today, not dreaming of what we need for tomorrow before we're able to do well. That we appreciate what we have in our hands today as a body, but also individually, and we're going to call for excellence of our own lives to look after and steward well what we have today. The second is personal excellence. And I read the scripture last week in 2 Peter, uh, 2 Peter 1 about how God builds our lives, but that he takes the promises of God come from this place, which is its own glory and his excellence. And as a result of the receiving of those promises, we are built up to become like Jesus. Now, the, the, uh, the awesome thought for me in that scripture is that he, in building our lives, making us these, this holy, this house, is that he takes from his own excellence and he puts it into you through the seasons of your life. As he builds your life, he doesn't build it with a teaching or with a doctrine, he builds it with himself as you discover who he is. And so we wanna be, we wanna hold that as a value that people walk in here, they not only discover God in his presence, but they discover God in his community and in his people. I think that's an awesome thing. And I don't think that it's too much to uh, hold on to. Wouldn't you agree? The fifth value that we're gonna build with is, is celebration. 
And um, last week we spoke about John 10.10, but everybody knows what the devil came for, don't we? And often we are celebrating or speaking about more what's been done and what's hard in our lives, not what's been done and what's good in our lives. Now, Jesus came to give life, but not normal life, to give abundant life, to bring abundant life. We want to be people that are going to celebrate the life that we've received in Jesus. We're going to bring our attention back to what we've received in him, back to what he's done in us and what he's currently doing, always with the sound and shouts of joy in this house. Look what God has done. We'll, we'll tackle the mountains in faith, but we'll celebrate what's been done in celebration. Amen. And then lastly, missional, that we'll never be a people who are too consumed with what's happening within our own lives or what's happening in this house, that we forget about what God's wanting to do outside of this house. Now, this morning's service is going to tie in with, with the heart and the values of this, this house, and Grant and Alana are going to come and give an incredible missionary testimony as they've been on a journey themselves in more ways than one. But I, I really want to invite you to buy in. And if you were here last week, we gave the opportunity to reaffirm commitment to the house. And if you felt to do so, that actually to, to come into covenant with the house, that this is the place that God has called you and you're gonna be fruitful and full of purpose in, while you're in this place. Amen. I know I'm not gonna have another opportunity, so I'm making sure that I've said everything I need to say. Um, but God, Grant and Alana, won't you guys come up? I just wanna honor these two. Um, Grant is... Uh, Grant wears many caps. Grant wears many caps in this house. He's one of the pastors. He's a leader of leaders. Uh, He's a man of substance and integrity. And as a couple, they have carried the burden of missions uh, for many years. And they've carried them in different ways. But uh, Grant has gone and Alana has stayed. And you know, sometimes the staying is harder than the going. And I'll say a loud amen to that. Uh, I feel guilty when I go uh, and leave my wife at home because the mission at home is harder than the mission wherever, (laughs) anywhere. Um, But really, they've both sacrificed to the nations in different ways. And not only sacrificed, but been faithful in the relationships that they've built and and maintained over many years with no promise of significance or no promise of of, uh, purpose, only really just connected to people in obedience to God. And they've got an incredible encouragement, which I think is so timely and seasonal for us as a church. We only spoke about this on Friday. I was so, um, how can I say this? Anyway, when they were away, they, they first, after the first week of, of being in Norway, they, the first weekend, they sent a message back to say, oh, it's just incredible, and God's done so many things already, and, and uh, so many miracles, and then signing off, we'll tell you when we get home. Like, they're only home in 10 days. I thought, what? How can you say that? And I just thought, look, okay, I'm going to let that go. Um, but anyway, it's so amazing that they did wait. And we spoke about this on Friday and then decided that they would take the service. And they're going to take it in the way that they take things uh, according to their gifting. And I want to just say, guys, relax, be released, and, and share your heart and impart something to us that we don't have. It's only in you. Awesome. Why don't you just give Thanks, them a round of applause? Thank you. Thank you so. so I think that just the journey, uh, God's goodness. The excellence, really the expression of God's heart that you can hear today is just mind-blowing to me. And I, I know you're going to be encouraged. But you know, in Psalm 16, it says that God's placed boundaries that on us that are good. And, and they are to really <laughs> enlarge us, aren't they? To, to really show us his goodness. And, and it's, it's an inheritance that he wants to release in us. That it is the pleasant places that he puts us in. And um, so this story is going to go back a bit, okay? And, and I say go back a bit because it, it really is something that you have to track, but we're going to get through this quickly so that you, you can get the fullness of what God did in these days that we were, were away. So we really, really are excited to be here today. Um, in the earlier service, I deleted my notes by mistake, so I found them again, but it's all in my heart. And I think you've heard me say before that it's all about the heart, and if we can just deal with our hearts and put our heart, position our hearts right before God, we open the doors to everything that he has for us in our lives. So literally, we, we were incredibly bursting this morning. I couldn't even keep my feet straight. And we're still bursting to tell of all that God has done because we didn't fit it into the first service. There is so much. But we're so excited to tell you today of what he's done when we went to this mission to Norway, Denmark, and London. God put a message on both of our hearts. We had to prep individually and preach together and 
It was so exciting because only yesterday, we, we wanted to keep this a secret from the whole church, but we did meet with Simon and Chairs on Friday, and only yesterday did they send us those six values that he's just reiterated now. And everything that God had on our hearts for Norway, Denmark, and London were those very things. And that's just such confirmation that God loves us all, and he's speaking the same thing to all people. But what was on our hearts specifically was believers reaching their full potential in Christ, intimacy and relationship with God and people, and purpose in the house. True relationship reflects those values that Simon was just um, speaking of. And it honestly felt like God illustrated our entire message by what unfolded after we preached. He showed us an illustration, and he's still showing us today, of just how his divine plan works. And it's, it's so important that we have a godly perspective on life and on our lives, because what could have been seen as a mistake was actually a God-ordained plan. So, yeah, Bronte. So back in 1993, I went on a mission trip with Jane to Europe. And um, what was meant to be a two-week mission trip ended up being almost two years for me where I didn't come home. And in that time, I actually, I met the, on the very first part of the trip with Jane, we actually met, I met these crazy Danes, as I call them, okay? And I became good friends with them, and I went, I had the privilege of going to live in Denmark, in Copenhagen, and, and, and serve with them in a local mission and, and a few things in, in the city, and I built a relationship with these guys. And I tell you that because, see, God, God has things in mind that, that we could not have understood or foretold. And so... Come, come forward 10 years. Um, yeah. I, I really wanted Alana to, to meet these guys, and she'd heard so much about them. And I'd, be, I'd been across a few times in between this time to see them. Um, but we had sabbatical, and Fiona had released us on sabbatical. So we went across, and I took on a grant's mission journey um, to meet all the, the people that, I, that I'd made friends with and the church that I'd served in. So we went from, from Norway and, and Denmark, and we went to Scotland and England. I never took across to Canada. It was too far. But just, just went on this journey, and, and this is where I think a significant part of what we'll tell you about today unfolded. So it was just so amazing to, be, to, take, to go with Grant to somewhere that God has, had really put something in his heart and to journey with him into these nations that were so close to him and to meet the people that God had put into his life. So when we, when we went in 2004, Grant hadn't seen these friends for 10 years. And we went and we just instantly connected with all of it. All of it. But our story today pretty much starts in 2004 on that trip. When I was six months pregnant with Adam, we had traveled for 30 hours getting to Norway there was a broken down car in the story, and strangers picked us up in Norway. So we were, after 30 hours of traveling, six months pregnant, I was kind of tired, we sat at a bus stop with two very large suitcases that our friends in Norway keep reminding us of. I was very pleased we took small suitcases this time so they couldn't laugh more at us. So when we arrived at the bus stop, we were where we should have been, but there was no cell phones. We were just supposed to meet our friend, Grant's friend, Elsa Marie, and her then uh, boyfriend, Torstein who we'd never met. We're sitting and we're sitting and we're sitting, and nearly three hours later, with still a pretty good attitude, we were waiting, and a man comes up, and in very broken English, he says, are you Grant and Alana from South Africa? We say, yes, he says, come with us. We were, oh, okay. And he proceeded to tell us how Torstein's car had broken down and they couldn't catch the ferry over, and please come, Torstein had called him, please come to his house, they're gonna still be many hours. So we went to the house and were given food. And no, we went. We, they told us that we refused the food. They, we were given tea, and um, she said she asked us what we were doing there. So we told her we had to meet Grant's friend Elsa Marie and Torstein, and we're going to go and stay in his beautiful um, forest lodge near the fjords. And she took one look at me. And she says, "You're not staying in the forest lodge." And we're like, "No, no, no. We are. We're going to go and spend a week with Elsa Marie and Torstein." And she said, "The forest lodge." Is a is cabin. A, is a cabin. <laughs> it's a hike. You have to park your car, then carry all your things. You have to hike to it. Then there's no running water, no toilets, and no electricity. She says... <laughs> so, I mean, with that... I was I game. I was in. But my wife... 
not so as in. she says with that she gets up she goes and gets her keys she says you are most welcome we are absolute strangers she says you are so welcome she gives us keys she says you are so welcome to stay here for the week for the duration of your stay in Norway please make yourself at home I have to leave early tomorrow morning to go to work but um, here are the keys make yourself at home and for now because it was now it was it was late it was like half past nine at night or something that we were waiting at the bus stop she says please go and sleep and make yourself at home so I just said like yes thank you so much Grant said well we'll have to wait for our friends to come and cautious Grant adventurous Alana says no we have to wait for our friends and just decide because we've committed I said thank you very much so with that we went to sleep and a few hours later in few Danish Danish true Danish style we were woken up with flags screams whistles and jumped upon to uh, by Grant's friend to say welcome to Norway and we spent the next day with them in that cabin and decided very early on during that lovely day that we did spend with them that that's not where we were spending the rest of the week so we spent the rest of the week with these new friends Anjun, Uwe Martin and their their little daughter Julie Marie and during that time God really knitted our hearts and we we kept saying like this we've met because Torsten's car broke down isn't that incredible but God knit our hearts they introduced us to another couple Solve and Svenug, Svenug. who have actually been out to visit us in South Africa in the past 13 years and it was just so incredible meeting and getting to know new friends and it's shoot forward three years 2007 um, myself and Neil Fisherman you remember Neil went to Germany to to do a, a presentation as well as a thank you to a donor who had given money to Quack here and um, I really felt in that time that I needed to go across and visit the guys in Norway and, and just see what God had and I didn't know what but I just know God was prompting me so I spoke to Fiona and he said cool go for it so I went, and I, I literally spent uh, a weekend with them in, in that time. And during that time, I, I just, they were in a very difficult place um, themselves. It's a very affluent country, but they'd both been retrenched and were unemployed and living on the dole in the country, which is very embarrassing for them um, because it's just not the way they live in, in Norway. Yet, um, I know it was significant, and they introduced me to a couple of pastors, and I met these people, and... They, they said to me, like, like, why are you here? And I said, I just come to visit. I, I don't really know. Like, I know God wants me to be here. And, and so I, I said, well, I'm trying to be fruitful with my time. I showed them the presentation we'd done in Germany, and they didn't understand all the English. So they said, why don't you just leave the DVD and, and your little pamphlets and book that's here so we can actually go through it slowly and to get to understand what you're doing in Kwake. And I left. And they were totally, she speaks, she told us now, how incredibly amazed she was that Grant would come all the way South Africa, he'd been in Germany, and then come all the way to Norway. It's quite far, guys. It's like right up north, for those it's of you who north don't pole. know where. It's, it seriously is very high up north. It's not one quick little hop and skip and jump. And she couldn't believe, they couldn't believe as a family that Grant would choose to come and just spend three days there with no agenda. There was no, he didn't want to preach, he didn't want to, there was nothing that he wanted but to reconnect. And so much of our lives can be gained. The, 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 the destiny that God has for us can be gained through relationship. It was for relationship that Jesus died. And so often we dismiss the people in our lives and we, we, we don't see it as significant. But people are so significant. Relationships are everything. It's the only thing we take into eternity with us. And most, many of us will invest, and we'll talk about investment, we talk about it in financial terms, but investing in friendship, investing in relationship is the best thing that you can do. And Grant has really been so phenomenally faithful every year sending a, we don't have a mass group, this is the Lloyds, whatever, but just sending out personal Greetings to people that God has put in his life. He's so faithful with friendships. And it's a real, sometimes in the church, we get so waylaid by things that we believe God wants us to do and the work that we're involved in and work inside church and work outside church and ticking boxes. Sorry, cursed, I've used your thing. Um, but we tick the right boxes and we do what seems to have a good appearance. We're too tired for relationships. We think that. We think, we thinks. We think it takes too much effort. We think it, 
it, it costs us too much because it takes a vulnerability of heart. But we get to choose how much of our heart we open. So let's, let's fast forward a bit now. So I told you 2004, we met them. I went back in 2007. Around Christmas time, 2015, um, I got a, a message from Anyun to say, please, can you pray for my brother, who one brother was going through a divorce. He'd had a heart attack and he, was, he really was ill and they weren't sure if he was going to make it. And she said, please pray. And so I did pray and, and had this interaction with her on, on email about, you know, how he's going, da, 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 da. And then just the one day she, she, she just said something. One thing, she said, oh, when are you coming back to Norway? And I giggled. <laughs> I'm like, oh, I don't know when, when that's going to happen. And I really had put things like, for that part of the world, I put on the back burner, and actually I think it had fallen off the shelf somewhere. And I, I'd actually not held it in my heart like I know God wanted me to. Um, and so I, I said, oh, you know, I'm busy and going to Africa and God's got doing this and I'd, you know, it'd be lovely to pop over for a cup of tea. That's what I said to her. And she said, yes, it would. And then over 2016, about three times, she says, when are you coming? And really, she pursued myself. And, and it, it really was a godly thing because I, I, it, was, it stirred something in my heart again and awoke and saying to me. And, you know, some have been saying, like we got that scripture from the beginning of the year, that, you know, we need to be strong and courageous and actually so we can cross over into the promises. And I know God put promises in my heart 20 odd years ago about that part of the world that I have not seen. But this lady pursued, got to this, the new year now, 2017, and she said, Grant, I have a gift for you. When are you coming? So I'm like, courier it. I said that to her. <laughs> like, why can't you courier it? I mean, I have this good relationship with them. So she says, she says no, you've got to come fetch it. And, I, and then I felt convicted. I knew, okay, God wants me to go. So I spoke to Simon, and I said, they're pursuing me. And, I, and he said, go and take along with you. So I went and found out prices. And I, I said, to, I sent this email. I said, listen, it's going to cost about 16,000 rand to get there, and we need to believe God for this. And I think I probably can come in June is the earliest I can come. Um, and I'll tell you that for a reason. So you'll hear later. In, in, so early June, probably the time we can come. Long story, cut shorter. She, she emails me back and says, God told me in the beginning of 2016 to start saving money for an air ticket for you. I have 10,000 krona, which comes to 15,500 rand when she sent it over, for your ticket. I was blown away. I thought, God, you are amazing. It was so amazing then. Just that, we thought, God, you are enough. That you've rekindled a dream by confirming, just by even saying... I've, God has saved money. I mean, God, God had told her to save money prior to that for grants to come over. That was enough. But God kept saying to us, I'm not enough. I'm more than enough. And so, got the ticket. And we, Lon and I had been saving money. I'll tell you this as well. You're going to hear about this later. Saving money for something specific this, this year. Um, that God put in our heart. And so, in, in, in saying, Lon, I really believe you need to come. And Simon's saying she, she really feels she needs to come as well. We, we took this, this money that, uh, that we'd been saving, and we used that to get the air tickets so Alana could come as well. Shame. Grant asked her, well, can, my, can I bring Alana as well? And she said, of course bring Alana. I'm just so sorry I don't have money for her. He said, I'm not asking, I'm not asking for money. It was just like the gift, and you know, it was a little like, can I arrive with Alana too? <laughs> so they were like, yes, of course. And, you know, just God, God reminded me, and I would remind you, he never forgets his promises and he watches over his word to fulfill it it does not return void and I was really excited for me this was the gift they spoke of I'm going and so off we went and we arrived there so we arrived at their house and it was honestly like God squashed 13 years together Grant and I have not traveled internationally together since that trip we have not been away together for 13 years internationally and so it was just so exciting going back to the same place of his dreams and where it was so significant in our lives as a couple and when we arrived it was just like no time had passed and I have not spoken to Anyun or Uwe Martin or their girl or their child in that time Grant has maintained the relationship uh, by phone call and with Facebook and SMSs. But when we arrived, it was like we had seen them yesterday. And it was so special. And she was almost like jumping up and down. And she said, I've got a surprise for you. 
So we were like, what, what, more, what could be a surprise for us now? I mean, it was just so amazing. And 20 minutes later, in walks the guy, Torsten, who we've had, neither of us have had any contact with in the last 13 years. And it was him whose car broke down 13 years ago. And it was because of him that we had this relationship. And interesting enough, you know, he had gone out with my, one of my best friends, Elsa Marie. He had been out with her for only two months, and then they broke off their relationship. And in that two months was when they came to Norway and the whole thing transpired. And he was so, he was like, will they ever remember me? Will they even be accepting me? Because we, I went out with her for two months and it was their friend. Her. And it was just amazing to reconnect with the guy and actually to be able to just embrace him again. And, and remember, he was, he was the start of saying in this relationship. And, and it was really amazing. Really it was amazing. him who made the phone call to his friend in Oost to say, please go and fetch my friends. Elsa Marie knew nobody in, in Norway. He knew this, this family. So it's just amazing how we spent the next two days, three days, just richly conversing about the things God had done and the things that were on our heart. And God was just the center of every conversation for the next couple of days. On this fast forward to Sunday morning service and incredibly... In, in Norway, the church is almost like, they don't close, but their church is probably the size of our church, even building-wise. And they have a small room in, in the back, which is smaller than the city hall, that they use the summer for church because everyone goes down south to get away from the cold weather. So they go down to Spain, to the Med, whatever they do. And so from a church of about seven, 800 people, they, they go down to a, 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 probably about 80 people into the small room. And in, in the summer, they, they, they always do different get different guys in and the pastor happened to be away so he had set up um, different ministers for every Sunday for a while he's away um, on holiday and he, he managed to get for every Sunday but this Sunday that we were there he could not get anybody so by default we were it and he wanted every Sunday for a couple to share the word which was also amazing so and, and when we had left here Simon, Simon prayed of us that there would be a duality of ministry and, and it would flow together in ministry and, and, and it really was quite amazing. And so we step into something where we together got to minister. Because we only know, knew really when we got there. So Simon had prayed this over us. We only knew that when we got there, like Grant said, do you want, what do you want? Do you want me to preach? Do you want her and I to preach? She said, no, definitely couple. We want you both to, to speak. So it was so amazing that after, um, after we preached, and well, we really did. But can I say something? It was, it was quite funny. I felt like I was home because we got to church like two and a half hours before, and uh, we were helping set up chairs like you guys do, and we were setting out coffee, and, and it, was, it was quite a thing. I thought, oh, they like us, you know. They also have like these coffees and lots of food afterwards and cakes and all that, and, and the, our host, Anyun, was, was quite nervous but excited, setting everything up and pulling stuff out the fridge, and I thought, where's everyone else to help? Like, it's just Lance, myself, and, and her family setting everything up, and uh, Again, you hear why this was happening. She's not a leader in the church. She's just a congregation, not just a, she is, she doesn't have a position. She is a congregation member who is passionate about the house and she was hosting us at this event. So I think she felt very um, responsible and very like, I hope this all works out. At one stage, shame, I put my hand on her back because she was speaking in tongues and all the rest of it. I was starting to feel quite pressurized that I was expected to deliver something very, very profound. And I said, to her, please don't worry, we really are trusting God with everything that comes out of our mouth. But, it was really but, funny too, because you know, some of you cringe when you come in with the welcome tunnel. I was the welcome tunnel. I had to play the flute over everybody walking in the front door. <laughs> we welcomed every person into that church. He so, played the flute and I greeted them. <laughs> and they all speak Norwegian. <laughs> ah, Tusentak. But it was amazing, because after we ministered, we really felt like God had done something and when we sat down it was it was kind of like <sighs> like that God had released something and she's Anyun stood up and she started speaking in Norwegian and the the uh, pastor the, the associate pastor quickly came and sat next to us and on the front row and he started interpreting to us what she was saying and she was telling the church of the story of how we met the story that I told you just now and she told the church, I'm going to read a bit here so that I can be accurate. So he was interpreting to us. She told of how we met 13 years ago. She thanked God for Torstein's broken car. And she spoke of how touched she was in 2007 when Grant visited her and her family. She, she told the church how two days after Grant left, 
She was praying in her usual spot and she looked down and she saw the Kwake pamphlets that Grant had just left on the table there. And at this point, she asked the pastor not to interpret. So we just sat there while everyone spoke in a foreign language and we didn't know what was going on, but it was okay. She showed the church, she pulled out, she had a file in front of her and she pulled out a card and I recognized it straight away. I'm an artist and I'd, I'd hand painted this card uh, 10 years prior and Grant had taken it and written a thank you note to them. And she read the card out to the church. And in it, he had written the scripture that says, no eye has seen, no ears heard, nor mind conceived what God has prepared for those who love him and are called according to his purposes. This was 10 years ago. In that card, he had left them 300 kroner. He'd been there for three days. He left 300 kroner and they were really, really financially strapped at the moment. Two days after he left, God spoke something into her heart, which you'll hear about just now. She then calls up a friend of hers who was visiting the church that day specifically for this purpose. And this friend shared a story of how God had told her to give Anyun something. But she didn't, she didn't feel so confident that it was God. So she said, God, if, if this is you, please ask Anyun, like get Anyun to come to me, which happened, she gave what was required of her to give, and Anyun was conf it confirmed what God had spoken to Anyun's heart. I hope that will make sense. In the first service, at this point, we called Lolly up because this is what they did to us. They called us up. Lolly's gone home, so we're not going to call her up. But at this point, they, she, they called Grant and I up, and Torstein, who was also visiting the church that day, and we stood there and she spoke. She, nothing was, was translated, was interpreted at this point. Spoke her heart to the church. And she then picked up something really massive, which was all wrapped up. And she opened it up. Want to tell them? And, and the, she revealed. And it was a big reveal. And what she had done, she had gone to her local bank and got, you know, like when you were in Wimbledon and, and you get these big checks that you hold out and you, your prize money. And she presented... What God had shown her back in 2007, what she had to do. And she had taken 10 years to raise 150,000 kroner for Kwake. That amounts to over 300,000 rand. She had never ever told me this. The church did not know. The church the didn't even know. The only people who knew was her, her husband, her daughter, this friend who actually sowed, God had spoken to this friend to sow a thousand rand to Anyun. And that was confirmation that Anyun had heard from God. In her time of struggling financially, two days after Grant leaves, she's sitting in her prayer time and she feels, she, she, she hears God say, I want you to raise 150,000 kroner for the orphans that Kwake is working with in South Africa. So and I, I'm, I'm blown away. And over the years, she kept, you know, she kept asking me, so how are the orphans doing? So I'd send her reports and I'd, I'd take it like off the web page, whatever. I'd, I'd send her stuff about the, the kids. And, you know, she was using this information, firstly, to make sure that she was still on track because she, she kept doubting that we were even working with orphans still. Secondly, to send as information to everybody in their granny in Norway. I mean, she emailed, I don't know, she even emailed the Queen of Norway. Yes. She got a letter back from the Queen of Norway saying, well done for the work you're doing. Sorry, we can't give you any money, but keep it up. She, she, she went and got a lottery license so that she could do a, a raffle in the country. People, she sat next to an airplane, gave a whole lot of jewelry, which she raffled off and, and, and got thousands of crowns for, for the raffle that she did. I mean, she, she, her daughter from age eight was doing a cake sales and selling lemonade in the summer and was even in the local newspaper. We got the clippings that we took photos of, of yeah. raising money for us. She diligently kept a file of every transaction. One lady donate gave her five thousand kroner, which is a large. That's ten. That's over just over ten thousand rand. One lady gave her that. In the ten years, this is what we find phenomenal. In the ten years that she kept this quiet, as God had not yet released this to Kwake. 10 years of silence. Simon, you, we kept you waiting for two weeks. We've had our mouths shut for two weeks. We only met with Simon and Chez. We didn't tell the team. We haven't told anybody in South Africa except Simon and Chez on Friday. That was two weeks of like, we were literally 
bursting. We haven't told our kids. Grant and I, <laughs> 10 years, guys. But that was, that was obedience and diligence. And you know, in that time, not one person, now I'd just like to, you to think about yourselves personally and how you feel about your tithe and your offerings, seriously. During that 10 years, not one person who sowed even one cent or 5,000 kroner asked about the appropriation of those funds. Do you know what that speaks of? It doesn't speak of I don't care. That speaks of pure trust and relationship. Out of pure trust in what she was doing in relationship with her, it wasn't only her friends, strangers gave her money, but friends also sowed. Not one person checked with her. And she has been so diligent. She's got an entire file. I wish we could show you the movie, but we didn't want to have media because we wanted it to be a surprise, but we'll probably post it on the website or something. But we've got lots of uh, documents and, and media for this. She's got an entire file donated to Kwake. She lives in Norway. It is very far away, very high up north. A little town called Us. <laughs> you know, it's amazing too, that in these 10 years, Precious, remind you of this, my darling, David, Mickey, Tuli, Taquanda, all these kids, they've been prayed for by, I don't know, umpteen people in a nation who have just got photos and little stories about their lives. Because, she was yeah. so thrilled to hear that Precious is a minnow, and she's adopted into our home. She was so excited that Preshi had been adopted. This is somebody that's been praying for you, Preshi, for the last 10 years. She doesn't even incredible? know you, and she's prayed for you. It's so incredible. She, everything that Grant had sent to her over email, she's got them all in this file. So she had taken these documents to people, and she just said, we, we want to raise funds for orphans in South Africa. You know, and what blew me away, too, is that the time you God, because, you know, at the end... Well, at, at the end of, uh, well, we meant to go at the beginning of June was the original plan. But in the end of June, we had a Kwake service there, which yeah. actually repositioned us and, and, and really brought a, 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 def a definition and, and an and a accurate appropriation of how we need to move forward with what God's wanting us to do through into, in the community through Kwake. And I just think, isn't it incredible that God has even released this now? Just to affirm even what God, he's doing. She was quite blown clear. away because we had taken that. We went to Norway, Denmark, and London with no agenda. We had no agenda. We went out of obedience and we went because with anticipation of what we knew God was going to do something. We had no idea what. And you know what? He has our lives mapped out for us. If we will only walk with openness of heart and in purity of spirit and in obedience, there is so much waiting for us. We could not have planned one of these days. We survived on very little sleep. People say, how was your holiday? It was lovely. We had four hours, six hours max a night. Not because we were whatever. It was... It was relationship. We spoke our 16 days away. Not away, it was investing. We invested more. It was the most phenomenal time, and we couldn't have planned it if we'd tried. You know, and then, so we, we come home from, actually overwhelmed from this meeting, but the, 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 the whole coffee setup was actually not the norm at their church. It was Anyun setting up a celebration to say, to say, thank you, God, for what you have done, and I've actually achieved the purpose that God had for me for these 10 years. And I, I mean, that just blew me away she, as well. She, she baked, baked all these cakes. She provided the coffee. And the whole church picked out like we do. Christians know how to eat. It's a good thing. And, and you know what happened too? Like people were so overwhelmed that they gave towards the coffee and tea. And she just kept saying, no, 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 don't. So at the end of, end of it, we, we get home. And the elder, the elder who was doing all of the, the finances for the, that service and says, what must I do with the one and a half thousand crowns that, that, that I got for, from your coffee and tea? One and a half thousand krona was, was raised just from, not raised, it was just given from tea and coffee. And she, she even, we were sitting at her table. Honestly, I feel like I was in a God's presence bubble suit. Like it was so, his presence was so tangible. It was so overwhelming and so weighty. We were just all like, drunk in the spirit it was 
a phenomenal experience. And we were, she was showing us the letters and she was showing us the, the file that she'd kept. And, and her daughter, who's 18, I, we took a photo of her holding the newspaper article from when she was eight. And she's basically spent her entire life raising money for orphans in South Africa that Kwake work with. While she says to us, Grant and Alana, I didn't expect this money. And so I'm offering it to you as a gratuity. You're so welcome to have this money because we weren't expecting it. I, the money I've made, I baked the cakes with and everything and coffee, that's my personal contribution. I don't want the money back. So she says, please, you can have this money if you want to. I went, thank you. And in my heart, I thought, Sheesh, that's incredible, because I was trusting God for my ticket to be paid, and although this didn't cover the ticket, it was something towards that. And I thought, wow, I said, thank you so much, but something didn't feel right in my heart. And I glanced over to Grant, she says to me, she, she said to us, think about it, and then let me know what to do. And I looked over at Grant, and he was like, uh-uh, <laughs> quite clear. And I was like, oh. And then I, I was like, <laughs> I was like, no. Okay, quite okay. And as I as I did that, it felt whew, I felt a release and a peace. It just something just didn't feel right. And I, he said, quite okay. She's no, no, no. You can tell me later. And we no, we that money must go to quite okay. Put it with the other money. Not even ten minutes later, she gets a phone call. She goes downstairs. We are still overwhelmed, looking at letters from the Queen and letters and financial statements and all the rest of it. And she calls me down. She says, Lana. Come downstairs. So I went downstairs. And this is about Hobbes 9, quarter 10 at night already. Yeah, it's, I can't say it was dark because it doesn't get dark in Norway. It's light until after midnight. But it was Hobbes 9 at night. Walk down the stairs. There's a lady in the doorway. And Yun says, Lana, there's a lady to see you. I'm like, who who's comes to see me in Norway? Who knows me in Norway? So I go to the door. And this entire interaction we're about to, to tell you now took place. We've got photos in the doorway. There was no time or no... There's nothing in us to say, come in and have coffee. It was just so overwhelming. She says, she says, hi, Alana, we, we were, I was at church this morning. She was visiting that church that morning. And she said, for a while, she's had a sum of money that God had, put, had asked her to put aside, but she wasn't sure where to put it. And when Grant and I spoke about Kwake, she thought, that's it. I need to give this money to Kwake. And she said she felt so excited that she knew what to do with the money. But she said as she made that decision, something just didn't sit right with her. And she says, I didn't feel right in my heart. So I then prayed. And I said, God, what do I do with this money? And she felt God say very specifically, give this 10,000 kroner to Alana for her trip to her homeland, Israel. Now, uh, at that point. Now, I told you earlier that we've, been, we've had something in our heart that we've been saving as, as a family towards. And it actually is a, a trip to Israel because we really believe that God wants us to go. I was totally blown away. I mean, I literally all, I, I tried not to crumble at her feet. Olivia, who only heard about this in the first service, Olivia is our 10-year-old daughter. She had Israel on her heart in November last year. She came through to us one day and she said, Mom, Dad, we need to go to Israel. And a couple of times she said, Israel, now I'm Jewish. I've never been to Israel. Olivia, Adam is turning 13 this year and Olivia turns 12 next year. Those are very significant ages in, for Jewish people and coming into an adulthood. And I said to Olivia, we'll go. Maybe when dad has sabbatical, we'll go. But it didn't kind of, it wasn't, nothing was sitting well with me. I just said, we'll go. And then one morning I woke up and I felt God say, Israel 2018. I said, Granty, we've got to take this seriously. Olivia's heard God. We need to go to Israel 2018, which is the years Adam will be 13 and Olivia will be, be 12. And our kids don't get pocket money. It's just how we are. And But if we find money on the, Zach finds money on the floor. And he's like, Mom, money for Israel. <laughs> and they've each got their savings. He even told us when we went overseas now, keep your eyes peeled, he Dad. Did, he told me to keep my eyes peeled. <laughs> he told me to keep my eyes peeled because I'd found money for Israel. <laughs> and as it was, on the plane going to Norway, I found a shiny coin. And for me, it's, it, God speaks in different ways to different people. But when I find a shiny coin, it speaks something from God's heart for, to me. But... The, the fact that, that, jumping ahead, Olivia, we've been saving money and, and 
putting money aside every month and diligently pursuing something that's on God's heart. But for this lady to confirm something personal that's on Olivia's heart, and on the plane over to, to Norway, I said to God, like, this, I've kind of made a promise to Olivia that we're going to go to Israel, but now I'm on a plane to Norway. And earlier in the year, I was on a plane to London to be with a friend whose mom died. And I'm not scared, like, like, I don't have a poverty thing in me, but at the same time, I don't have masses of money. But I have a heart that serves God, and money serves me. And I thought, God, if you want me anywhere, you will provide for me. But I just want to be wise with whatever you put in my hand. And so I had even asked God, and I did not remember this until this money was presented to me in Norway for Israel, which has confirmed something personal and the string of intricacies that God has knit in relationship that my, our daughter's faith can be enhanced because she knows she heard from God and God has provided. And you know, where we invested in our ticket to Norway, God provided in that the return was so much greater. The return is, we don't know what waits us, awaits us in Israel. So, and very interestingly, so Alana is like overwhelmed says, who are you? What do you do? So yeah. she said, well, actually, my name is Helena, and I, I've had, a, had ministry in India, and she just tells a little bit of a story. Like she, had to, she actually laid down the ministry in India be, with working with, with the Dalat, the lowest sort of class. Little, of, little kids. With little kids, kids and that. And it, it really was a sign that really hurt, broke her heart that she had to do it, but she really felt God saying she had to le- release it. And so, so Lana immediately thought, Lee Grady, because we all know Lee, and he, he works... In India, and, and so she looks at me and says, "What about Lee?" So I said, uh, "I don't know. Lee works with abused women. It's not really kids." This lady burst into tears. I mean, this is all like I'm in tears. Then I have a word from God, and she's in tears, and it's just like. And she says, "That's my passion is abused women. That's who I, I, I've, I always want to work with. Is actually India's only opportunity has been children, but I really want to work with." So I got on the phone, actually on the way to, to Norway, I'd, I'd spoken to Lee, we were in, so I was singing Dubai, he was singing Schiphol in, in Belgium, we were talking to each other. So I, I sent a message, knowing it was probably the middle of the night there, but he was awake, and I had this conversation, and within half an hour he was connected with this lady, which I don't know what's going to lead to, but God has intention, doesn't he? And he knows our, our lies, and he, and he knows what he intends for lies, and I, I just absolutely gobsmacked. Blown away. The most amazing, well, not the most, another, you know, and the whole time, just when we thought, God, you've done enough. God, you are just so incredible. That is enough. He would do something more to show us he's not enough. He's more than enough. And every step of the way, we were gone for 16 days. Like we could, we could go through every day, but we don't have the time. Every single day, he showed us, I'm not enough. I'm more than enough. Surprises with people, gifts that were lavished on us. Uh, we've come back wealthier than when we left. Now that is crazy because we invested, we spent 16 days in three foreign countries and have come back more wealthy in, in more way financially and in our souls. You know, God wants us to prosper and be in health, doesn't he? In our soul. And, and I really was just awakened to God's, like he re-envisioned me and, and re, and re it's almost like, you know, we speak of that being strong and courageous to, to go into the promise. That, but there was a time of, of consecration, a time of, of set, setting aside of, of the people so they could, they could enter into what God had. And I, I really feel like, like it, for me, it was just an awakening of that and, and starting to enter into. But I don't think it's just for me. I think mm-hmm. it's for us as a church. Absolutely. I really believe that. That God is, is opening up saying that, that is, we, we can have the privilege of going to serve to see his kingdom enlarge. And, and the incredible thing is, in, in, the, in the region, and because of time, I'm not going to go into detail with Denmark, all, all England, but Charlene and Denver send their love to everybody from, from London, and it was just so exciting to be with them on, on the Sunday where they actually had the most amount of people they've ever had in the service, 105. And it was so thrilling to be there. 31 visitors. I mean, that, that's crazy. I mean, it was our third their church of <laughs> visitors on the Sunday. Incredible. But what I, was, I saw throughout our short trip was was a hunger for God in, yeah. in, in people's hearts and but yet it's total dissatisfaction for where they're at where the house is at and realizing even with hearing Simon Chair's message on on value that, that there is there, there's no focus on what God values and, and what he 
the house of God. There's so can I, can I share about, so when, you went, when we went to Denmark, we reconnected with a group of friends that Grant had made 20 three, four 24 years. years ago. And they are not like a group. So we didn't walk into a group of friends. We pulled them together and actually reunited many relationships and friendships that had been, you know, from 23 years, 24 years ago. And we really did see a hunger. These people are all rooted in local churches, different churches across Denmark, but they are starving for the very thing that we have in this house. They're starving for food, for spiritual food, for the values that Simon reiterated this morning. They are they're serving in their churches, but they don't have what we have here. And, it's, and, I, and we say that humbly, you know, we are so blessed. And we, we have been given so much, and I think there's a responsibility upon us to give. We've been blessed so that we can be a blessing. Yeah. And, and for, for no other reason but to see God's glory manifest, to see his, his kingdom expanded, to see lives come into the purpose that he has for, for each you, one. And personally, you know, don't wait for somebody up here to tell you what to do. We are all this church. Church is church. Because it's made up of individuals. We're speaking about the house. But, and the house is made up of individuals that God is building. So we need to go out. We are rich. Um, we only say that uh, about them starving. It's because we are so rich. But you know, guys, we can, we can choose to live small lives. We can choose to live safe lives. Or we can choose to live lives that God has destined for us, lives that God has planned for us. Can, I, can you just share the story, the story with Anna, with the two paintings? So 13 years ago, I met this, this girl, who, who, this girl Anna, and she became a friend of mine. I say she became a friend, we were friends then, and again, I haven't stayed in contact with all these people. And Anna was an artist, and I remember being so incredibly... She is an artist. She is an artist. I remember being so incredibly inspired by her work and inspired by her excellence and her professionality and thinking, geez, I really need to rise in my own creativity. And that was 13 years ago. And we met up with her again now. And she said to... We had, we had a big bra with everybody. And she said, I'd really love you to come to my home. And there was only one day. We, we, lit, we had one hour because we were just one-on-one -on -one with so many different people. And we had one hour. And to be honest, I said to Grantie, I don't know if I can. Like, I'm so tired. And I don't know if I can. And we said, let's, let's do it. Let's just do it. And we had to ride a train. And we went to her house. We had an hour there with her. And there was such, like, there was no time had passed between in the, these 13 years. And I found myself scratching around in her home. I mean, who does that? <laughs> Honestly, I was, like, looking at her bookshop, pulling out books. You and do. I was... Scratching around, <laughs> I felt so at home. My shoes were off and my feet were on her couch, and she was making us coffee. And while I was scratching, I pulled out, I mean, it wasn't even on top of something, it was in a, in a locker. I pulled out this wad of paper and I sat on the floor and I found it. She says, Oh, you found my art. And there's a photo of me somewhere with me sitting on the floor, and I've got all of her prints set out before me. And honestly, what I thought was, oh my gosh, I would love to own <laughs> one of these. And I thought, I don't want to embarrass her by asking her how much it costs in case I can't afford it. I, was, I just wasn't sure where to go. So I was looking at it and straight away as I spread them out, two images really uh, spoke to me. And while I was looking, she said, Alana, I would love to give you one of those. She said, in fact, why don't you each choose one? Now, two images had spoken very strongly to me, so I very carefully pointed to Grant which one he was going to choose. <laughs> she wasn't that careful, trust me. You know when you get the kick under the table? <laughs> so I took these two, and I actually even felt guilty because most of the other images, there were two or three prints of them. These two, there was only one of each. And I looked at them, and they just spoke to my spirit. And she, the one was of a house and then it was three islands and on one island there was a dog there was a person and there was a, a house, a house hey. and, three islands, and yeah. she said oh that one that's funny it's got a funny long title that one is I hope these islands touch each other I was like I can't believe it this is what God has been speaking this is the message Grant and I have been bringing about relationship about intimacy about community it speaks to me the other one was of a is, is of a little person sitting behind a sewing machine mending some sewing something and Grant saw it straight away I didn't even see it straight away which is so unusual for me because it's a it was a heart and I 
I'm all about the heart. And here she says, oh, that one's so significant and special to me. That one's called mending hearts. I thought, God, you are so incredible. I now will forever have an illustration, something that I love, art, of our very trip and everything that God has wanted to say. Mending hearts and building community, building relationship. I've got them in an image. And that was so encouraging to her, who'd actually grown cold and discouraged in her creativity. She was really at a crossroads. And just us being there in, in her home and, and this miraculous experience confirmed what God had put in her heart. She's so gifted and t- so talented. And yeah. Yeah. And I just, you know, I, I'm blown away at God that he sets things up in his way for his time. You know, he was mindful of, of my life back in 93 and what he had intended. But he was also mindful of some kids who weren't even born yet in Quadebeca. <laughs> and he was mindful of things that we still can't comprehend and conceive. He's mindful of you and me. It's, it's incredible. Absolutely incredible. And all he wants us to do is, is to live in it. To participate in it. And we choose to. We choose to engage in, in, in our relationship with God. And he says, love me, and it's as, as you love me, also love your neighbor. Correct? Let's do it. Let's be it. Let's Nothing has to share. qualify you. Nothing qualifies us. There isn't a something that you have to have in order to spread the life that he's given us. And, you know, God is building his kingdom. And we can't, I don't want to labor in vain, ever. I don't think you do either. But, you know, he's building, and, and even these values that, that we, we release to us to to shape us, to express the heart of God, to express the kingdom of God, to release the power of God into our everyday life as we, as we are missional people, getting out there and just being the salt, being the light. And I just want to encourage you, church, like, like we, it's been quite personal for Lana and myself to, to have gone on this mission and, and to ex- experience the things we did. But I know it's, it's not just about us. It's about us the family here, and God's intentions for us as a family of believers in this house. It's so much bigger than we imagine. Sam is telling me to say whatever I want to say. I think um, I don't really have something to say. So So I just... um, just feel to not waste or lose this opportunity. So... What's stirred up in your lives over this trip um, is in the middle of what we're trying to discover in our hearts as a church. We started the series. I hate the word series because we like to box, box the, the work of God in a couple of weeks. But, but we started it that for the intention of awakening something within our hearts. The Bible says something about gifts. He says, if you receive the man, you receive the gift that's in him. Um, and it also speaks about the, the ministry gifts and what their purpose is, is to build according to that gift in the body of Christ. And as those things work together, we come into levels of maturity and unity. And I just feel just to appreciate what's on your guys' lives as people and as ministers and for you to impart something in the middle of this box that God would release something in our hearts first that we would see the fruit of as a church. Because you're right, it's not about you guys. That's absolutely rewarding and in your lives personally, but it's, it's something that he's given us. And I want to say today, you've received the gift, the testimony, but you've actually received the gift because it's not just what they've said, it's what's on their lives. And we want to really just take a moment to appreciate that in God and ask you guys to pray and impart. Okay. Father, I just thank you, Lord God, for who you are. And God, I even, as Simon just said, I even felt like this was a reward for us, Lord God. I felt like you rewarded us and you've shown us something that you've always been about. And God, I pray that every single person who's heard this message and and heard our heart, Father, would have the same experiences in you, Lord God, that they would experience everything that you have for them. God, I pray generosity 
over this house, Lord God. And God, and I am not speaking about generosity of what's in our purses or wallets, although that is important, but God, generosity of our lives. Father, that we would open our hearts more and more toward you, Lord God. I thank you, Father, that as we give, we are able to receive from you. As we receive from you, we are able to give more. Father, I just speak life into this place. We are not serving you because you're a good idea. God, we're serving you because you're true. And God, if you are true, then you have promises for us. We have life. And God, I pray for an impartation that would just speak to people regardless of our giftings or our talents or our fears or our personalities. God, we have life to give. I pray that we would give it in Jesus' name. Father, I know that you have positioned us for such a time as this to cross over into the unknown for, for us, Lord God. But Lord, you know. And Father, as we look to you in this time, Lord God, that I thank you that you would, you would actually order our steps. And, and Father, you would enlarge us and that your spirit would be upon us as your people. And even now, Holy Spirit, that, that, that you would permeate every single heart and life in this place to, to enlarge, to multiply. Yes, Lord. Lord God, to, to release your purposes. Yes. And Father, we're, we're even with dreams and in lives have, have just grown dim and even been forgotten about. Lord, I ask that, that you would stir up your purpose. You would stir up your heart. You would stir up your dream for the individual in this place, that we as a body would begin to function and flow and actually have our being in you as a body, fulfilling your purpose, Lord God, and, and being, Father, just relevant, being ones who, who really bring hope and life by your spirit. Yes, thank you, Lord. And I, do, I really want to speak into the area of finances quickly because you know the Bible is very, very clear that we can only serve one God. And each of us needs to examine our hearts today because, you know, I think that there's many people who say they, they are serving God, but actually mammon is right up there with it. And that is a choice that every individual has to make. Now, I just want to say that I'm married to a pastor whose salary is not awesome. I am an artist. I don't earn a salary. I run my own business. It's twice a year. But I've been faithful with the little that God has put in my hand. And we are diligent with what God has put in our hand. But I do, we do not look to our finances. We do not serve mammon. Our finances do not limit what God does in our lives. And you know that we can say that from our mouth. But you, have, you need to check your heart. I know without a shadow of a doubt that God is greater than any money hindrance that is in your life. I know that God is greater than any salary you might get. But only you can determine where your eyes are at. Only you can decide what investments you make. As of the beginning of this year, Grant and I are completely 100% debt free. That is, that's a miracle. Artist. <laughs> Pastor. God. Three children. God, I've traveled twice now overseas this year. That is not, I don't count the cost. If God says go, you go. But you know what positioned us, what prepared us was our hearts. What allowed the movement. The, 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 even I don't, when I look at my bank, I don't know how we became debt free. It wasn't for anything amazing that we did. And it wasn't a huge amount of blessing that came our way. It was obedience. And I really feel to speak that because, you know, church, we speak about living in faith. I walk in faith. Seriously, how many of us use that term to just trust God for the next bit of food that comes onto our table? God is so much bigger than that. And I'm not suggesting that there's people who are not seriously struggling. But in your struggle, find your peace. We've struggled we found our peace when there was nothing we could do. We opened our hearts. We've always lived within our means and given beyond our means. When we had nothing to give, we gave our lives. We gave our hearts. We gave our home. 
We still give our home. Your lives can be small if you want them to be, or they can be everything that God has for you. Do not be salary-minded. Be God-minded. Be diligent with what he's put in your hand, financially, relationally, and everything that he has for you. There's so much he has for this church. Let finances not be the hindrance for us going. Let us not depend on the church to provide. Where you find yourself now, ask God for the peace to rule and reign over your heart. There is no provider other than God. He is my provider. He is your provider. Some of these things we know, but I'm asking you to just, I feel like God has got something new. He's got something new he wants us as a body to walk into. And part of that is admitting whom we serve and laying down the idol of mammon. I'm done. Father, we thank you that you, you watch over your word faithfully to actually bring it to pass. And Lord, that you strengthen us, you give us the grace every day to live in your truth that we can enjoy the fullness, not just life, but the fullness of life that you have intended. And I ask, Lord God, that, that you, would, you would continue to speak to us as we go from, from service today and that you would lead us in your truth, that, that we can enjoy the fullness of life that you have for us in every way, in Jesus' name. Amen.